Uh, good morning again, and we'd like to also welcome those that are joining us in our live stream at this time. Today we will continue in our study in the book of Romans, and so I would invite you to turn with me to Paul's letter to the church at Rome. We'll be reading from the cha first chapter, and we will begin with verse 8. Now this may sound familiar because we read this same passage last week. Here's what we find. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. Let us pray as we seek God's guidance this morning. Father, we come before you acknowledging that we need you. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, that we cannot understand your scriptures unless your Holy Spirit makes it come to life. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit will speak to our minds and give us insight and understanding that you will speak to our hearts. We ask that you will guide and direct us in our lives from your word. I acknowledge my dependence, Lord. I cannot teach this word in the flesh nor what I want to. And so I ask for the anointing power of your Holy Spirit. I ask, Lord, for your cleansing, that you would make me a vessel that is fit for your use. And Lord, I ask that what we do here today will honor you and glorify you. And it's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Last week, we began exploring eight characteristics of a faithful disciple. Eight characteristics of a life that is totally surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And you may remember that the question that we are asking is not, have I mastered all eight of these characteristics, but am I growing? Am I actively engaged in a process of transformation? Is it the desire of my heart as a disciple of Jesus to truly surrender myself to his lordship? Now, last week we looked at the first two characteristics, and so let's just review those for a few moments so we can keep our train of thought going with this. And so we found that a faithful disciple has an attitude of gratitude, that we are moving to the point of always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. And what we found is that when we have this attitude of gratitude, it actually protects our hearts. It keeps us from the dangers of things like complaining. Because if I am being thankful, I'm not going to be complaining. It keeps me from the danger of being critical, either critical of other people or critical of God's blessings in my life. If I'm being thankful, it's going to keep me from being covetous and wanting what someone else has. It's going to protect me from the danger of being, of being comparative where what I have has to be better than what someone else has. And if we're thankful, it can protect us from being conned or deceived by our enemy. 
And so when we are thankful, it actually opens up our eyes and we actually see more of the blessings that God has poured out into our life. Blessings we would have never have seen otherwise. And so we found that when we are thankful, it pleases our Lord. Because like any father, our heavenly father wants his children to be thankful. Now we found that faithful disciples are obviously having an attitude of gratitude, but we also are to have the disposition of a servant. Not a servant who is one that only serves to be seen, whether by others or just when they think the master may be watching, but serving our Lord wholeheartedly, serving him enthusiastically and with spiritual fervor. And yet that doesn't mean that the way each of us serves is going to look alike. We're unique. God created us to be unique. We have a different DNA. We were born with different natural abilities and talents. And then when you were born again, you received gifts from the Holy Spirit that are unique to you. And so the way that you are going to serve is not going to look like the same way that I serve. The way that God's calling you to serve him is going to be different in that. But our goal will be the same. And the reason for our service is to glorify the Lord through the proclamation of the name of his son, through the proclamation of the good news of Jesus. And when we do serve wholeheartedly, we found that it protects us once again. And this time it protects us from becoming like the world around us. In other words, what the Bible would call as being worldly living according to the flesh. And it also means that if we serve wholeheartedly, that we'll not have the danger of our service being just lukewarm. And when we serve wholeheartedly, it means that when we finally see Jesus face to face, we can hear those beautiful words, well done good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. And so faithful disciples are going to have an attitude of gratitude, the disposition of a servant. And as we continue looking in this passage, we find that Faithful disciples are going to be prayerful. In chapter 1, verse 9, Paul writes, Constantly, I remember you in my prayers at all times. Paul has a posture of prayer. And so I think it behooves us to ask the question, what is prayer? Because I think that we have this tendency to take something that is so simple and we can make it complicated. And prayer is simply talking with God. It's not magic. It's not using magical words. It's not trying to manipulate God that we get what we want. And so if prayer isn't about getting God to give us what we want, that leads another question. What is the purpose of prayer? And as we think about that question, I'm reminded of a recent survey that asked people about prayer. And do you know that 85% of the people in the United States say they pray? And yet out of those, only 38% knew the purpose of prayer. So what is the purpose of prayer? And so I want you to listen to me. The primary purpose of prayer is to enable us to have an intimate relationship with God. Let me say it again. The primary purpose of prayer is to enable us 
to have an intimate relationship with God. So the purpose of prayer is not to get what we want, but it's actually to give God what He wants. That is, to be in a relationship with Him so that He actually works in us and through us. And so prayer then is communication with God. And communication is the basis of a relationship. You can't have a relationship without communication. If you have a husband and wife and they were communicating and then suddenly that communication breaks down, then the relationship begins to deteriorate. You have to have communication to have a relationship. And if we're going to have a relationship with God, we have to have communication. And communication doesn't mean that I'm just doing all the talking. I don't know what you call that other than exhausting. I mean, have you ever been around anybody that you never get to say anything? They just, they just keep going on. I don't know how they have so many words in their vocabulary. They just talk and talk and talk and talk, and you don't get a chance to say anything. See, prayer's not us doing all the talking. It's communicating. We talk to God, and God talks to us. And so the next question we would ask be, what do we talk about? Well, as Paul writes to the church at Ephesus in chapter 6 and verse 18, he says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. In other words, we talk about everything. He also tells the church at Thessalonica in his first letter to them in chapter 5, 17, pray without ceasing. And so we read that and it raises another question. What does that mean to pray without ceasing? Does, I mean, does that mean I'm always to be on my knees, that I'm always to have my head bowed, that I have to have my eyes closed and I'm always praying like that? See, to pray without ceasing means that I am aware of his presence. You don't talk to someone unless you think they're there. Now, if you talk to someone you don't think they're there, there's a definition for that. <laughs> but when you talk to someone, you are aware of their presence. Now, you know this. Vicki and I like to travel. We like to go out west. And when we do that, we always drive. And it takes a long time to get there. But for us, that's a wonderful time. We're sitting together with one another. And listen to me. I am aware of her presence. That doesn't make me a genius. It just makes me aware. And so what do we do as we travel along? Well, do we talk all the time? No. But if we're driving and she thinks of something, or I do, and we want to share it with the other one, well, we, do. we just start talking. Well, when we are aware of the Lord's presence, that's what we do. If I want to talk about something, the Lord's here, I just start talking to the Lord. To pray without ceasing means that I am just constantly aware that He is with me. And it doesn't mean I'm talking constantly, but it does mean that I'm talking about everything. Now, through the years, I couldn't tell you how many times I've heard people say something like this. Well... I know that God is just too busy and I don't want to bother him with my little problems. He's got bigger things to take care of. Have you ever heard that? Let me tell you, there's two major problems with that kind of statement. The first one we need to understand this. God does not have any big problems. I may have big problems. You may have big problems, but God doesn't have big problems. He's God. He's the creator of the universe. And so there is no big problems that God has. And so, no, he's not so busy to deal with your little problems because that's the only kind of problems that God knows. Little problems. And so we mess up with that. But then I think also there's this problem that we think that that may sound a little pious. I just don't want to bother God with my little problems, and in reality, it's as far from the truth as you can get because it's a lie from the devil. See, it's a lie to keep you from experiencing the power of God in your life. You don't want to bother God with your little problems. You don't want to experience the power of God in your life. 
You don't want to bother God with your little problems. You don't want to experience the presence of God in your life. If you don't bother God with your little problems, you're not going to bother God with giving you peace in your life. You see, this is what Satan wants us to do. God wants to hear from us. He wants to hear about the little problems in our life and the big problems in our life. He wants to hear about our life. He wants us to talk with Him. And so as we talk about prayer, there are actually four components of prayer. Now that doesn't mean you always have to have all four of these components in prayer, but these are four components that actually work together to take us deeper in our relationship with Christ. Because remember, prayer is about a relationship. Prayer is about having an intimate relationship with God. And so when we have these four components, they actually take us deeper in our relationship. Now, when you think about communications and relationships, it ought to make total sense with this. Because when we're talking to someone, if we're developing a relationship, we don't keep it superficial, do we? When I talk to my wife, we're not talking just about superficial things. Oh, sometimes we do. Sometimes they're very superficial. But we also go deep into the heart as well. What we're feeling, how we're experiencing things in life. And so if prayer is to develop a deeper relationship with Christ, these four essential elements work together to take us deeper in that relationship with Him. And they can easily be remembered using the acronym ACTS. A-C-T-S. You knew that before I spelled it, right? This is how God acts in our life, okay? Now, I'm not going to keep repeating that. You've got the acronym. You can sort of fill it in from there as we go along, right? Because you're smart. And so as we begin, the very first component of prayer is adoration. See, prayer doesn't begin with what we want but with what God wants and who He is. And so it begins with adoring or praising God for who He is. And so as we pray, it's remembering God. Lord, today I praise you because I know that you are the creator of the universe. I praise you because you are my Father. See, we take the character of God and we praise God for who He is. And as we study through the scriptures, we learn more and more about who God is. And so we praise him in that. We give adoration unto God for who he is. Now, here's why this is so important. Not only are we praising God, and that pleases him, but it reminds us of who God is. And so if I am praising God today because he is the creator of the universe, then I am reminded myself of just how powerful God is. That his power goes beyond what my mind can even imagine because I can't even see all of the universe. I can only see a little bit of the universe when I look out. And yet he's the creator of all of it and everything in it. And so I am reminded of the very power of God and why that is so important is that when we look at the character of God, it affects our faith. And faith is a vital part of prayer. Now, when we think about faith being a vital part of prayer, so often we focus in on the size of my faith. If I have a lot of faith, then I can really have this powerful prayer life that's developing from that. And Jesus made it clear that it's not really about the size of your faith. In fact, Jesus even talked about faith that was as small as a mustard seed. And so it's not about the size of my faith. It's about how big is my God. It's not about faith. It's about the object of my faith. See, if my faith is in the wrong object, it just doesn't mean anything. If I am putting my faith in the government, well, that would just be stupid. 
if you're putting your faith in me, well, that would be stupid. But we put our faith in God. We're seeing how big he is. This is the one that we are talking to. Jesus stated it this way. I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, move, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Why? Is it faith that's moving the mountain, or is it God that's moving the mountain? It's God. And so when we bring adoration before God, we are reminding ourselves, this is who I am praying to. Now, Jesus taught us this very thing in the model prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's actually where he was teaching us to pray. And he began with adoration, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Two characteristics of God. He's our Father. Now, I know that's hard for some people because you didn't have a good father. But your heavenly Father is the best. He loves you. He loves you so much that he gave everything for you. And so when you think of him as father, you think about that kind of relationship. This is a God who loves you, who cares for you, who wants the best for you. And then he says, hallowed be your name. He's holy. Now, remember, Jesus was giving this as a model prayer. He's saying, when you pray... You need to have adoration as a part of your prayer. And while you may not begin here, it's a great place to begin because it's reminding you of who God is. It's praising Him, but it reminds you. And our view of God is going to determine how we pray. If my view of God is that God is somehow tight-fisted and God doesn't want me to have anything, then I'm not going to ask for anything. But if I see him as a God who has his hands open and he wants to give good gifts to his children, then I'm going to pray accordingly with that. Now, the next component of prayer is confession. You see, adoration is about God. Confession is about us. And once again, we can go back to the model of prayer where Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And so confession is when we face the hard truth about who we are and where we are as disciples of Jesus. You see, confession is where we name the stuff that is cluttering up our life and gets in the way of a vibrant relationship with God. It's where we confess our sins. See, confession is a recognition in our life of our constant need for God's grace and forgiveness. Now, isn't it interesting? If we were perfect as disciples, why would Jesus have taught us to pray, forgive us our sins? We still sin in life. And so we still need confession as a part of our life. And the Bible tells us that when we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us of all unrighteousness. And so we don't bring excuses. We just bring confession. Now the third component of prayer is thanksgiving. And that is our joyful response for how God is at work in our lives. It is acknowledging, as James says, that every good and perfect gift is from above. Now, last week we talked about Thanksgiving, the attitude of gratitude. And we found that there is a tremendous value in giving thanks because it changes us. We're no longer focusing on what we want, but we're focusing on what we have. And then we come to the fourth component of prayer, supplication. Now, supplication just basically means request, and there are two types of requests that we make. The first one is intercession. Intercession is where we are praying for others. In other words, we intercede on their behalf before God. 
Now, we do that a lot in church, don't we? We shared prayer concerns earlier, and most of the prayer concerns were all about intercession. Pray for so-and-so. This is going on in their life. And so what we intercede on their behalf before God. We make a request on their behalf. And then there's just the request, and this is where we make the request for ourselves. We're praying for ourselves. Now, let me address this here, because I know some people think that it's selfish to pray for yourself. Well, I don't know how to address that other than if you don't want anything from God, then don't pray for yourself. But he wants to give to you. We'll talk about this a little bit more in just a moment, but God wants us to make our request to him. And when we make our request, we need to remember that we are entering into the presence of God for whom nothing is impossible. And so when we pray, suddenly Everything becomes possible. And as we take our concerns into his presence, we are inviting God to work in them and to work through us. You see, as disciples of Jesus, we need to understand the value of prayer. There is power in prayer. God hears our prayers. God hears answers our prayers. God makes things happen when we pray. But there's also another benefit of prayer. Prayer actually keeps us from sin. It was Jesus who said, watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. Have you ever experienced this? Okay, so you're wanting to be a faithful disciple of Jesus. You don't want to sin. And so suddenly you see sin in front of you. You've been watching it. There it is. And you go ahead and do it anyway. Don't raise your hands. We've all done that. See, we were watching, but we weren't praying. You see the temptation coming. That is when we need to pray. Oh, Lord, here it comes. I'm weak in the flesh. The Spirit's willing. The flesh is weak. I need strength. I need to know what to do. And so we watch and we pray, and it keeps us from falling into sin. But if we're not praying then there's that very real and present danger that we're going to fall into sin. And if we're not praying, our relationship with God will not be what it ought to be or could be. Because we're not building a relationship. We're not communicating. And James reminds us that if we're not praying, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. See, that's flat out telling us we're to ask God. We are to take our requests before him. It's not being selfish. It's being in a relationship. I remember when my girls were growing up, if they wanted something, they would come and ask. Now, if they came and demanded, it was a different story. I didn't respond well to that. Didn't respond well to manipulation. But when I tell you, I, got just, I can still see it in my mind. I'm sitting in my chair at the house, and my daughter, one of them, it could have been either one of them, they come up, they sit on my lap, and they hug me and say, Daddy, I just love you. And then, okay, what do you want? See, they began with adoration, didn't they? You know, you just begin to melt. And not that God melts, but God wants his children to ask. And how can we ever expect to experience the power of God if we're not praying? See, faithful disciples have an attitude of gratitude. They have the disposition of a servant and the posture of prayer. And faithful disciples are submissive. In verse 10, Paul says, 
I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. You see, Paul has a passion for the will of God. In other words, there is this overwhelming desire that he has where he wants his will to line up with the will of God and God's eternal purpose. Which raises a question. As a disciple of Jesus, why would I want anything that is not in line with God's eternal purpose? You see, in essence, Paul is saying, Lord, if what I am asking for is not in line with your eternal purpose, then I don't want it. You see, this goes deep. It goes into the very reason as to why we are here, the very purpose of our life. And when we have a passion for the will of God, we are going to begin seeing that everything is connected to God and his eternal purpose purpose now just as we've seen with the others we find this in the model of prayer as well because Jesus taught us to pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven now when we pray that I think sometimes we just have this general idea okay your will be done on the earth well you know where his will on the earth begins is with me, with you. If I'm going to pray your will be done, I'm saying I want your will to be done and accomplished in my life. You see, to have a passion for the will of God means that we are seeking His counsel, that we are asking what would you have me to do? Now, I think one of the questions that comes up when we talk about the will of God is this. How can we know the will of God? And as we answer that question, I think we need to understand there's actually two dimensions to the will of God or two questions that we're asking on that. Because the first one is the revealed will of God. And this is where God tells us in His Word what His will is. It's found in the Bible. For instance... It's God's will that we be obedient. Now that may sound like a duh thing, but I want you to listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. See, it's God's will that we be obedient to him. That is his revealed will. Now, we also find, as Paul writes to the uh, Thessalonican church in his first letter, chapter 4, he says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. Now, I know that's a hard word. It simply means that we are becoming more and more like Jesus. And so it's God's will that we act and think like Jesus. Now, that happens when we spend time with him. Yeah, I shared with you how Vicki and I communicate with one another. We've been married 36 years. And through that time, I mean, if two people are different, it's Vicki and I. You, you probably have noticed that. She's exciting, I'm boring, you know, we can go on and on with the list. But we're, I mean, we are just wired different from one another. And what we have found is after 36 years, we have begun to think alike. Now, I know that scares her. Now, here's my, here's my point with that. When we spend time with Jesus, we begin thinking like him. And so we can see how that sanctification is taking place. We're becoming more and more like him. And if we don't spend time with him, we don't think like he does. And so what we also find is it's God's will that we would be transformed. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and to prove what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so God's will is that we would be transformed. 
Now, why would we expect God to reveal anything about his will to us if we're, excuse me, if we are not being transformed? In fact, he goes on and he says, then we'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. And that brings us to the next thing that we want to talk about, because most of the time, when we talk about wanting to know what God's will is, we're talking about God's specific will for me and my life. What does God want me to do? What is God's will for this in my life? Is this God wanting me to get married? Is God wanting me to be single? Is God wanting me to go to college? Is God wanting me to change jobs? I mean, we can go on and on with the list. And so what we find here is God's will that is not yet revealed. And this can be called the mysterious will of God. So you have the revealed will of God, and then you have the mysterious will will of God, and the mysterious will of God has to be discerned. Now, let's make this really clear. If I am not interested in the revealed will of God, why would I think that he would reveal to me the mysterious will of God? I've got to confess, I've talked to people a lot of times in my life, and they say, I just want to know God's will for my life. And you're looking at their life and thinking, okay, well, then why don't you just start doing what he says? This is a great place to begin. Just start with obedience, and then maybe you can figure out what God wants you to do with your life, because we're not in a position to hear him if we don't want his revealed will in our life. And we can't know the mysterious will if we're not wanting to understand his revealed will. Now listen, knowing the mysterious will of God is going to involve scripture, prayer, searching, discernment, wisdom, dependence upon the Holy Spirit, and trusting in God's timing. In other words, it's more of a process than an event. Now, let me just use one example from my life. I really began discerning that God was calling me into the ministry when I was fairly young. I was probably still a teenager. And as I was discerning that, I had no idea what that would mean. But I'm sensing this is what God wants. And so it was a process that began, that went on for years. In fact, if I had understood right away God saying, okay, I'm calling you to be a pastor and I want you to be preaching the word of God, I would have probably been just so overwhelmed with that, saying, okay, you got the wrong guy just like Moses did. This isn't going to work out. But God doesn't do it that way. It became a process. In fact, as that process went on, I had no idea what it would look like. Eventually, I came to the place where I thought, I think God's calling me to be a youth pastor. Whew, thank God that was wrong. <laughs> but actually, he did for a while, but it was for a season. And it was in that season that he was preparing me for something else. Do you see how it's a process? Something really unique happened when I was a youth pastor. The church that I was a youth pastor in, the senior pastor had had a heart attack. And so he wasn't able to preach. And so the leaders in the church, they came and asked me, okay, while the pastor is recovering here, he's not going to be able to preach for a while. We want you to preach. And so I began preaching. And as I began doing that, I was getting these confirmations from people. And I'm thinking, okay, now this isn't what God's calling me to do. But, you know, God's just, he's sort of easing you into these things. Until eventually it became clear this was God's calling in my life. This was his will for Glenn. So it was not an event where in one flash of a moment I knew exactly what God wanted me to do. It was a process. Now, I've given you a process that was lengthy. Sometimes it's a very short process. Because there may be something that God's wanting me to do right now, and it can't have a lengthy process to it, and I'm ready for it. And so I begin trying to discern the will of God, and right there it is, right in front of me, this is what I want you to do. 
And so it's certainly just discerning what it is God would have us to do. And in one way or another, it is going to be a process that is involved. Now, as disciples, we need to understand the value of submitting to the will of God. And when we do so, first and foremost, it is the only way, the only way that we can ever know truth. Jesus says in John chapter 7, 17, If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Do you get the process with that? If anyone chooses to do God's will, then they will know the truth, whether I'm speaking it or not. Now, we are living in a world where there are many voices. Lots of people proclaiming truth. Even some idiots that are claiming we all have our own truth. Which, if you analyze that one, is pretty stupid in all honesty. But the way that we know truth is from the will of God of God. And if I don't care what the will of God is, then why in the world would God reveal truth to me? Now, when we submit to God's will, another value of that is it pleases Him and it glorifies Him. And when we submit to His will, it keeps our life on track. Have you ever gotten derailed? Don't raise your hands. I know we have. We've all gotten derailed. Sometimes we get derailed, we get back on the track, and we're derailed before we get started again. And the reason that we get derailed is that we're not focusing on the will of God. And so we get off track. And so when we submit to God's will, it will keep our life on the right track, and we don't just keep messing things up. But if I don't have a passion for the will of God, then there is that very real danger that I am going to make one disastrous mistake after another. That's the voice of experience. Just one after another, just keep making wrong decisions. In fact, Jesus talks about this in one of the parables he told In Matthew 7, he says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Now, that means you have a passion for the will of God. You hear what he says and you do it. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew against that house, and it came down with a great crash. You see, if we don't have a passion for the will of God in our life, we are building our life on sand and it will come crashing down. And not only will it affect our life here, but our eternity will come crashing down. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. As faithful disciples, we have to have an attitude of gratitude, the disposition of a servant, the posture of prayer, and a passion for the will of God. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you and we thank you for your word. We ask that you will just take it, that you will use it in our hearts and in our lives, that you will draw us closer to you. And it's in that name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I invite you all to stand for our closing hymn.